I'm Rich Carey. This is Jennifer Beatles. And you're listening to the Earn and Invest podcast. Fantastic location in the heart of Lincoln Park. Perfect two bedroom, two full baths with parking included. Open floor plan with all the upgrades, including hardwood floors, stainless appliances, and granite. Extra large private patio off of living room faces quiet garden setting. Master bedroom has walk-in closet. Both bathrooms have beautiful marble and stone finishes. New washer, dryer, shops, restaurants, and vibrant Oz Park steps from your door. This won't last. This is my listing on my condo that went up for sale today. That's right. I have four investment properties, and up until about a year or two ago, the idea of selling them never crossed my mind. But the truth of the matter is, the last year or two has been a doozy. Vacancies, property damage, a cockroach infestation, and repair after repair, I'm tired of being a landlord. COVID broke me. Am I the only one? And speaking of real estate, have you ever checked out the Real Estate and Financial Independence podcast with Coach Carson? You can find it at CoachCarson.com or wherever you listen to fine podcasts like this one. Coach is set on getting you to reach your financial independence goals by using real estate to cash flow on a regular basis. He not only describes all the tips and tricks for how you can get ahead, but then has real life examples, case studies in which he brings people on and they describe how they've used real estate to reach their financial independence dreams. Check them out. It's at coachcarson.com or listen to him wherever you listen to find podcasts like this one. Rich Carey just retired from the United States Air Force. He owns 30 units, including 20 single family homes that are all paid off. Rich, nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you too. It's great to have you on the show. I've heard you on other podcasts. I know that you just retired recently from the Air Force. Is that right? Yeah, I did. It was in August of 2020. Did a 20-year career, spent most of that overseas, and did most of my real estate purchases from overseas. Well, congratulations. Now you can become a podcasting star. Jennifer Beatles owns 239 units in four different states. She teaches investors how to create passive income through real estate. Jennifer, welcome back to Earn and Invest. You've been on the show before. Doc, thanks for having me back. So great to be here. If I remember correctly, didn't we have you on an episode about house hacking, right? Yes, yes. It's an interesting idea, especially in this time of COVID. I think house hacking looks a little differently. Maybe we'll discuss that a little later. Rich, I want to start with you. Tell me about how the pandemic has affected your portfolio. Did you lose any money kind of in the heat of things when we were at the worst, like last March? Yeah, excellent question. I remember when this all started, March of last year, I was pretty scared. You know, I was pretty nervous, like a lot of people were. I think from my perspective, and I've, and obviously I'm around and, and talking to other investors all the time, the the negative effects of coronavirus never really affected my portfolio in any in any way in fact in some ways i had less vacancy and less problems collecting money and i would say that i had less turnover during that time i think people just didn't feel like moving like maybe it was a hassle 30 units i don't think i've had anybody turn over since october I mean, that's kind of a long time <laughs> if you have 30 units and, and certainly one before you know, COVID, it was a lot more kind of steady turnover. So I guess the answer is not really, it hasn't really affected me financially in a negative way. 239 units is a little more than the four units I have or the 30 units that Rich has. I feel like everyone was really afraid at the beginning of the pandemic that we were going to see people defaulting on the rents. We were going to see people who normally we would foreclose on, but we couldn't because of what was happening. Was the bark worse than the bite? Did you actually find or realize any of our fears, Jennifer, in your units when push came to shove? Yeah, Doc, I very much agree with Rich. My portfolio has not been as negatively affected as I expected it to be last March. I remember, gosh, there are so many conversations between myself and 
my other investor friends, I mean, some of which have hundreds of units and we kind of banded together and said, well, shoot, you know, how, how do we take a proactive approach to this? What are some ways that we can kind of, you know, navigate this, uh, this messy situation? And also, how can we help our tenants? Obviously, you know, we're, we're in the business of, you know, owning, owning rental real estate for, for, <laughs> for passive income streams and also building wealth, but we can't do that if we're not also helping our tenants pay their rent and finding solutions to these problems. So fortunately, I have not been as negatively affected as maybe some others that I that I know. The two main issues that came up, we actually have an apartment complex in Irving, Texas. The median income in that area is $93,000. This is a very high income area of the Dallas-Fort Worth MSA. And unfortunately, when the interest rates went uh, took, took a dive, we had many of our tenants that actually moved out and purchased homes. While we were very happy to see them <laughs> become homeowners, that did greatly affect the complex. We actually went from about, let's see, we were 98% occupancy to 88% occupancy. So we lost about 10% um, of our occupancy rate for tenants moving out and in, into houses. And understandably so. I mean, our tenants were you know, stuck in, in the apart in these tiny apartment complexes, many of which were, you know, some studios, some one bedroom units, and they just wanted and needed more space. We have since now through some rent concessions and, you know, a few strategic renovations gotten back up to our occupancy rate, you know, but, but that was, you know, one negative effect. Aside from that, we've only really had one tenant that is in a unit that has the ability and, and can pay and is choosing not to. So really uh, over that amount of units, you know, one tenant that we know is choosing not to pay, um, again, is, is pretty phenomenal, especially if you compare, you know, rental real estate to other businesses who have been affected, again, across the board from everyone that I know, you know, I, I guess, as you had said, the bark was, <laughs> was definitely far worse than the bite. And so we, we hope that continues. Absolutely. Jennifer, have you found that the rules around eviction are making it harder to deal with that one tenant who's chosen not to pay? You know, so so again, I, I own in four different states and across, let's see, five different markets. So it is very different. It's very location specific. So uh, for example, my properties in Washington state, I have not been able to increase rents at all for the past year. The eviction rules are very strict in Washington state. Whereas, whereas this one tenant is in Tennessee, we have actually kind of taken a more proactive approach and tried to help them get into some programs and, and kind of, you know, again, tried to try to help a little bit more. And unfortunately, they've just not taken that help. They have not, you know, we actually, or my property manager was able to get them approved for some nonprofit funds to, to recoup the, the missing rent and they chose not to uh, fill out the application. So we are now currently, unfortunately, in the eviction process. So as far as the eviction process right now, in some states, you can evict for holdover. And so unfortunately for these tenants, I think the downside to this right now is that most landlords are choosing not to renew leases. So actually the property managers in most of my areas, right, Rich is saying, yeah, most of the property managers are saying, no, no, we want to go on month to month. And, th- and that's unfortunate for the for these tenants. I mean, again, most of our tenants are, are just great tenants. We're not having any payment issues. But that puts the tenant in a situation where, you know, we can choose to terminate their tenancy and we can evict in, you know, some areas for holdover. So that's how we're getting around that right now. Interesting that you brought that up. That's definitely, unfortunately, the way that these, you know, laws are set up and the way that there is an eviction moratorium going on right now it just sets up certain incentives, right? And the incentive is for me to give people month to month leases. Now, that's not like entirely unfair. I mean, it definitely gives the renter flexibility. And in some cases, they're just so shocked, they're so shocked that I'm willing to offer a month to month, a month to month uh, lease. But really, it's about protecting my livelihood. And if, you know, if things got dark and worse. And I just had lots of people that got on the bandwagon of deciding not to pay rent and knowing that they couldn't be evicted. I could simply say, well, okay, then, you know, I'm just not, you know, I'm just this month to month lease is over and you need to move out. And in Alabama, at least right now, that would work. 
So, and, and so Jennifer brings up a very good point. This is definitely location specific. You could even say city specific, but definitely state specific. And um, yeah, it sets up a lot of weird in, incentives, but that's that's something I've ended up doing. I don't feel right now that it's as important as it, as I thought it was a few months ago. I mean, I'm ready to start signing up people for year-long leases now, but it is something I went through. Rich, it's interesting. As we talk about this, I feel this tension between people who are landlords and care about the well-being of their tenants versus protecting their business. Mm -hmm. And I know, for instance, I had a tenant who lived in a building and all the things they thought they were going to get from living in the building, they weren't getting anymore because of COVID, right? They couldn't work out in the gym because the gym shut down. They had all sorts of problems. And I decided to give them a break on the payments for two months, right? Yeah. So I said, okay, I'll accept a little bit less in rent for two months to make up for this. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that tension often? Like, were you more willing during this time to say, okay, I'm going to give some tenants a break because these are hard times, right? Knowing I, that this is a business and you also need to make money. Certainly. Although I believe that I was doing both things at the same time. I mean, I was protecting my business and helping tenants at the same time. And probably the bi biggest example of this. And I believe that Jennifer was pretty much doing the same thing. Right at the beginning, right at the beginning of this in March of last year, you know, there were a few people that are just kind of like, I can't pay. I can't do this. You know, I don't know what to do. I'm at your mercy. Don't, don't kick me out. And a lot of the things that I was doing was helping them find that stimulus check, right? That never got mailed and helping them sign up for unemployment, right? Back when there was a 600, was it 600 a week? I can't remember. 600 a week in, in addition helping them go through all these processes. I mean, I was like going over to people's houses and getting on a laptop with them and like showing them how to do it. People that were pretty much not computer literate. You could not go anywhere in person back then. You know, there was, there was no office to go to. And that was definitely hurting, I think, older, older tenants that just couldn't figure this stuff out. So I kind of thought like, this is what the next three to six to nine, nine months to a year is going to look like is me just digging in and, and making sure that everybody gets the help that's available. But that kind of died out. That was like me helping like two people. And then life just kind of went back to normal. At, le at least, I mean, at least from my perspective, when it came to, to rent, it just kind of went back to normal and I didn't really have that problem again. And once in a while, I'll just point somebody to a certain resource and they'll take it. But that's, that's kind of what I ended up doing. Jennifer, I want to go back to the situation you were talking about where one of your units or one of your buildings was having more vacancies because demographics were changing. And what Rich was just talking were microeconomic issues, right? People having problems with losing their job and stimulus. But there's also macroeconomic factors. COVID and the pandemic has changed the demographics of our cities a little bit. For instance, I own in Chicago and there's definitely a move out of the city for multiple reasons. One is that most people are now doing remote work and therefore no longer have to be in close proximity. How do you think macroeconomics and kind of the changing in demographics is changing the way we as landlords hold properties? Is it going to affect us greatly? Oh boy. Well, time will tell. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, th I think it's going to take some time to really see how all of this plays out. I am very fortunate that my business model as it relates to investing in properties has, has been kind of within investing within a one hour radius of major cities. And so the majority of my properties have actually been outside the city. And so on one hand, you know, I had mentioned that in Washington state, we're not able to increase rents, but I also own properties about 45 minutes outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And Tennessee, according to U-Haul, had the most inward population uh, migration, or at least, you know, from a U-Haul standpoint, right, of people moving into the state of Tennessee. Nashville is one of the, the top markets that people are moving to. But from an affordability standpoint, uh, the rentals that I own just outside of Nashville are, are very desirable, right, for, for people. And so my rents have increased by 25% year over year in this one market. So back to the original question, yeah, I do think things are changing. I think that especially anyone with families, they are wanting to be outside of the city. The amenities are not as important now in the city because they have not had them for, in some cases, up to a year. 
And so I think people are looking for more space. They're looking for more room. They're looking for a more comfortable lifestyle to work remotely. So, so that's one trend. I think actually there's there's multiple trends that I'm seeing. You know, here I am in Tucson, uh, Arizona, originally from Seattle. My family and I have been traveling for five months now this week. And we are meeting families, you know, all across the United States who have chosen to, chosen to sell their home, work remotely and travel around. So that's an interesting trend. We've actually seen that in these RV parks, trying to find space in places you know, it can, can be a bit of a challenge. The other thing that I'm seeing is, and actually conversations that I'm having with other friends of mine who own rentals, is this idea of converting rental units into short-term rentals. And I'm seeing a lot of, especially younger millennials that can work from anywhere. They're almost becoming, you know, nomadic, right? Or, or they're, they're moving from city to city, working from their laptop, living in Airbnbs, You know, we've also experienced some of the harshest winter that I've seen across. I I was in Austin, Texas for that deep freeze. And so it's it's an interesting trend for for even just a younger person that has the ability to pick up their laptop, either drive or fly to a different city, live there for a month and live remotely. That's an interesting trend. So, again, I feel like we're kind of at the early stages of a few different trends that are happening. And so it'll be really interesting to play out how that affects real estate. So me personally, with my portfolio, I'm looking at how can we beta test this Airbnb model or short-term rental model? You know, I've been speaking with a lot of companies and in some cases you can make 25, 30% more by converting to a short-term rental model. The short-term rentals are also not subject to these eviction moratorium and these eviction law. So for landlords that are maybe frustrated by that and or having challenges, if you convert it to a short-term model, then that solves that problem. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how some of these trends play out. And again, with my portfolio, I'm kind of doing some beta testing and also having conversations with other investors to see what they're doing and how they're using these trends to their advantage. Rich, do you think that the COVID pandemic an associated recession is changing the way you buy properties. I've noticed, for instance, that here in the suburbs of Chicago, like the inventory is incredibly low and houses, single family homes are selling like crazy. Mm -hmm. You as an investor, you're looking for inefficiency. You're looking for properties that no one else is interested in so you can buy them cheaply. Has it changed the way you're buying? Yeah, interesting question. I mean, of course, I don't feel like that COVID by itself is changing the way that I buy. I think it's, you know, COVID and what ended up not happening as far as things didn't get crazy combined with this, you know, these low interest rates and this I don't I, don't, I almost want to call it a hysteria, but a buying frenzy that's going on right now. That has changed things. Now, one thing that I did that was interesting was I bought my multifamily, a sixplex and a fourplex at the beginning of COVID, right at the beginning. And at the time I had no debt to my name. So that was kind of a big deal for me. And I also, I also bought my primary residence at the same time. So I pretty much locked down about, you know, a million dollars in debt in a few months during a pandemic when, you know, people were worried that tenants were going to stop paying. And, but I would say that I did that because I already had significant assets and I could afford problems that potentially newer investors could not afford. I didn't think, and I still don't think that is the, it is the greatest time for a newbie investor to jump into the market. I think, I think that I have caution and I had caution back in, in March and I still have a lot of caution for anyone that is sort of getting started in real estate and has like this small nest egg and sees everyone else like making money left and right in real estate and doesn't and, and has this fear of missing out and just wants to get in and buy something. I have a very good friend who uh, we, we recently went, went together to Indianapolis and uh, checked it out as a market. And she's been trying to buy real estate there as you know, for the past couple of months, just this morning, she got outbid She got outbid because there was 11 offers. She was already going, I think, about 20,000 over asking, right, on a cash offer. But the 11 other offers, somebody else decided to overpay by more. So I think that the way I feel these days is that 
this isn't necessarily the best time to buy. Uh, in fact, I have shit. I mean, it's interesting what your story you brought at the beginning, Doc, because I am considering selling some or potentially all of my portfolio and taking advantage of this frenzy, I mean, to be quite honest. It's an interesting question, Jennifer. I've heard people call the real estate market juicy right now, right? So they're looking at stocks and they're saying stocks are overpriced or high priced. They're saying bonds are low and real estate is hot. And they're really starting to talk about alternative investments. I know it's hard to talk about real estate as one thing because it's actually a bunch of different markets. But is it possible that we're at the top of the real estate market right now? Who knows? (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't think that we'll know that we're at the top until we start going back down, right? What I can tell you is that every day that passes is one day closer to the next recession. And so every investor needs to invest as if we're in a recession. And so, Doc, to your question with Rich of, you know, has his investing strategy changed due to COVID? You know, my answer would be that actually my investing strategy has not changed since 2009, I invest exactly the same as I did in the 2009, 2010, 11, 12. I mean, it was mostly bank owns, foreclosures, and short sales at that time, right? So the the type of seller has changed for me. We're not dealing with banks. I haven't dealt with a bank sell in quite some time or a short sale. But I think that, uh, gosh, I mean... As far as where the prices are, it is very hard to say. There's so much liquidity in the market. The kind of common challenge amongst my friends is that everyone is sitting on more capital than they know what to do with. And the challenge that that actually investors in my community and my friends are saying is, where do I put my money? And so that's an interesting challenge because it's not efficient to have it just sitting in the bank, right? Right. So I think as investors and as people sitting on, you know, capital, investable capital, we have to make a decision of where to put that. And and, and now there's so many different, I mean, again, we can, you know, kind of go into conversations related to where to put that. Real estate is kind of my my thing. And so, you know, again, I, I, I look at the market very differently in the different markets that I'm invested in. You know, we have partners, we have teams in about 35 markets across the United States. I would say that some markets are late stage, meaning that they've probably peaked. I would say that there's other markets that are very early stage, and there's probably a three, four year run before they hit their peak. And so I I don't think that that's a one size fits all answer to that question. I think it's very market dependent. And it's very, I mean, again, you know, we got into Tennessee about 18 months ago and nobody was looking at this market. Nobody was talking about this market, but the trends were there. And so that's actually what I do. That's how I approach investing in real estate is I look at the trends, mostly where are people moving to and then trying to figure out, is this market making sense or can it make sense for my investment strategy, which is a value add strategy. I want to find properties that are underperforming for one way or for one reason or another and then add value, increase the rents, which makes the property appreciate, right, as well, and increases my cash flow. So there's a lot of markets across the United States that still have that value add strategy. It's just a matter of finding them and then putting the team in that place. And so that's that's my focus. I think that there's still a lot of opportunity for people to get in, maybe just not where every other investor is looking. So here I'm in Phoenix. I think Phoenix, the, the prices are quite expensive. It is very difficult to find a deal that makes sense. So that is probably not a market that I would I would choose. I come from Seattle, Washington, and you know, the cap rates even today, even though the the rents are down 15%, the city of Seattle rents are down 15% year over year. Investors are still buying there and they're buying at about, you know, a four cap, right? To me, that is a late stage market. I think that that is a very risky investing strategy to be buying into these properties where you're putting, you know, 25% down and potentially have negative cash flow every month. So to me, that does not make sense. But again, I think there's a lot of other markets across the United States that do make sense. Jennifer brings up a lot of very good points. And one is, where are you going to put your money, right? I'm saying, gosh, you know, things are crazy because of these uh, multiple offers and everybody's willing to waive all the contingencies for inspection and, and overpay with cash offers. 
But at the same time, do you take that money and do you put it in the stock market, right? Because we're at just as much risk of seeing a downturn there as well. And so that does uh, create an interesting dilemma. And, and when it comes to these investing, I think investing in real estate for a newbie or somebody who's just getting started, what I, I guess what I would say to them is what's not going to work is going on the MLS, you know, from, you know, you're, you're in California and you're looking at Montgomery, Alabama on the MLS and calling up the agent there and like making an offer. That's not going to work. You're going to, you're going to overpay. Everybody's doing that. It's about figuring out some way to get a off market or somewhat off, off market property. And I think that's something actually that Jennifer is sort of involved in, but you've got to find the deal and that's going to take some education and it's going to take some work and it's going to take a, hopefully an interest in real estate because you're not going to, just, going to just walk in and start buying stuff and make any money these days. Uh, it's just not going to happen. I think the other thing, Rich, I really appreciate that you said that you're also thinking about selling some of your properties, maybe you know, be taking advantage of the high prices. And I would add to that, I'm actually doing the same, but I'm doing it with a 1031 exchange. And so I'll give you an example. I have a triplex outside of Seattle, Washington. I bought this for uh, $225 in 2015, put maybe $10,000 into it. Uh, it came with existing tenants. We sold it in December 2020 for 415000 And then we were able to do a 1031 IRS, an IRS 1031 tax deferred exchange to get into 19 units out of state. That property was cash flowing about $1,300 a month before we sold it. And now we're going to get into, we actually found an off-market uh, new build outside of Boise in Nampa, Idaho. That property will cash flow about, I think, $700 a month. And then we're working on a 17 unit in Nebraska, and that one will cash flow, I think, about $2,000 a month. So I think that there's some opportunity to trade in some of your late stage properties and really level up both on the unit count and the cash flow. So I think that that's a great way to kind of take advantage of both right now. Again, you know, having that ability to defer the taxes while the 1031 exchange still exists. We don't know. We don't know what the future holds for the uh, 1031 exchange, but we have a lot of investors in our community that are doing that. You know, Doc, you're in Chicago. The properties in Chicago are, are quite expensive as compared to other markets across the United States. But there is an opportunity that you can sell, again, defer your taxes and get into other cash flowing properties in other markets that have great off market deals that are cash flowing at a you know high high rate there, and again, so you can you can kind of cover both. Yeah, just so people who have never heard of a ten thirty one exchange, it is a way in which you can take your capital gains from your current property sell that property. And then if you invest within a certain time period and you follow certain criteria, as long as you get the money reinvested, you don't have to immediately pay taxes. Now, what people do have to realize is it's tax deferral, but it isn't per se tax abatement, which means at some point, if you sell those properties and take capital gains, you are going to be paying those taxes. However, at least as the tax code stands so far, if you keep those properties and live off of them from the cash flow, and eventually when you die, give them to your children, then the cost basis for those properties falls back to zero at the moment that you pass away and give them to your heirs. So it's a very, very good way of deferring taxes forever if you plan to hold on to those properties and use them as a source of cash flow and then eventually give them to your children. On the other hand, people do have to realize, for instance, I did a 1031 exchange unless I continue being in the real estate game forever, at some point I will have to pay those taxes. So something just to remember. In the first half of the show, Rich and Jennifer talk about their expectations in the COVID pandemic and how they would affect their real estate business. After the break, we delve into which sectors will be most affected. But first... Today, I'm introducing you to a better way to money. We've all heard of credit unions, but you know why credit unions are the best financial partner for you? 
Unlike other financial institutions, credit union members are owners, so profits are reinvested in you. This means better rates, better service, low or no fees, and those dreams you're chasing, well, they can become a reality a lot faster. The best part? There's a credit union for everyone and membership lasts a lifetime. Federally insured, digitally connected, join the millions of Americans already getting more for their money. Visit yourmoneyfurther.com today to find a credit union for you. Again, that's yourmoneyfurther.com. Rich, I feel like when we're talking about these markets, right, some are kind of at a low state right now, some are at a high state, we're really talking about geography, but there are all sorts of different types of real estate. Perhaps single family homes are not the way to invest anymore. Jennifer was talking about Airbnbs. I know there've been also a lot of changes to commercial real estate, right? Because with people going remote, companies getting rid of some of the commercial real estate, maybe there'll be some opportunities there. Are there some sectors right now in real estate? And I'm not talking about geographies, but I'm talking about sectors specifically, Rich, that you think are going to be hot and are underappreciated at the moment? Well, I mean, I think I think that there's this trend, right? Or the, the trend that, that, that Jennifer was talking about earlier is maybe that people because of COVID, right, don't want to be cooped up in apartments and don't want to be in big cities and want to be out in countrysides. And so if you follow the logic of that trend, then I think single family homes and suburbs can still be a very attractive choice. The problem is, are you going to be able to get them, you know, at a, at a, at a decent price right now? You know, they're, they're, they're more affordable, they're more liquid, and, and they're, they're trading pretty high right now. So again, it's about potentially picking the right market, not picking Austin, Texas, because that's been on fire for several, several years. But that is a possibility. But what I also say to that trend is, can't that trend end relatively quickly? I mean, couldn't couldn't we kind of figure out, okay, but COVID's no longer a big threat a year from now or a year and a half from now. And I kind of do like the the city and I think I'll go back to the city. So I think there's still a lot of unknowns, but I'm not discounting single family homes as something that's very attractive. Again, it's going to, you know, market specific. I have not seen issues here in Montgomery, Alabama, very small sector to, to, to look at, but I haven't seen issues of like, oh no, my tenants in multifamily are unhappy and my tenants in single family are not. Or, you know, it's there, there, there's been no difference. Everyone just seems to be fine. So, Jennifer, it begs an important question. Obviously, we all kind of freaked out with the pandemic. Do you think that there are going to be long term changes to real estate because of what we've gone through? Or do you think most of this is short term and will revert back to normal in a year or two? Oh, again, that's <laughs> such a great question. I do think that there are going to be some long-term effects. What will those be? I don't know. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this eviction moratorium plays out because that will change, you know, lease agreements that will change how we screen our tenants. That will change if, if, you know, maybe we'll uh, landlords will do month to month, or maybe there'll be more, you know, kind of almost like a shorter term rental type lease agreement. So that I, I don't know. Again, I think it's, you know, shoot, we're, we're a year into this, but I feel like we're still in the early stages of really seeing how all of this plays out. One thing that we haven't spoken about is the commercial financing changes that happened last year. So unfortunately, we found some really great commercial deals last year, commercial multifamily. And most banks had stopped all commercial lending. So again, these are loans under a million dollars. So these are primarily small local bank portfolio loans that we're looking at. And that was a big hit. That was a really, that was a big challenge for investors where they found a great deal and they were well capitalized and, you know, looked great on the loan application only for all the local banks to say, we are not doing commercial lending right now. So that has since opened up. Not all banks that we were used to, you know, speaking with about those loans have started to lend again. I think some of the more conservative banks are, are seeing how this will play out longer term before they get back in. But some banks have gotten back in. I think triple net leases, those those are going to be affected. Again, I think it's a little early to, to know what, what will happen there. But yeah, I, I do see a lot of changes coming our way. 
as real estate investors. But again, I think it's going to take a little bit of time to really see what those changes are. Rich, there are a lot of unknowns. Certainly the COVID pandemic and recession was one of them. But the other big thing that happened is we had a major change in politics, right? So we just had a presidential election. Congress has changed hands. Legislation may be very different than it was in the last four years. How do you think the new administration is going to affect real estate investors? Do you think it's going to be real estate friendly, real estate unfriendly? I mean, legislation (laughs) really will play a big role in in things like evictions, right? So Jennifer is laughing at me or with me, (laughs) I think based on this question. I mean, it's it's a tough one. And I'll say one thing about this podcast too, and I've been on a, a fair amount of podcasts. This is, I think, the highest level of questions that I've ever heard on a podcast before. So congratulations for that. I'm just trying to, you know, stump you. That's my (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I felt like, you know, it's kind of, okay, let's let's just say the, the, the word Trump, right? When Trump was in office, he, moratoriums came out, right? I mean, these moratoriums happened. I would have maybe thought that someone like Trump might have been in a position to have less of, of moratoriums than there actually was. But for whatever political reasons, th- those moratoriums were in place and uh, they did affect lots of locations. I'm not so sure that now that we have a democratic administration that we're all going to all of a sudden going to see some much larger amount of that type of regulation. I also don't believe I don't believe from a business perspective that it could work long-term. I mean, you can't take away a business's rights to like, you know, to run properly, to to collect the money that they're owed for services given and be kind of like saying, we're going to let people walk into Walmart and, you know, take stuff off the shelf. And if they can't pay, then that's tough for Walmart. They're just going to have to deal with it until, you know, December 31st of 2022. Like that's just not going to work long-term. So I could see maybe a slight uptick to, to appease what people expect, but I just don't think that it can be what many people worry it might be if they really came down hard on evil landlords. Jennifer, I'm going to throw the hot potato at you. I mean, do you see any major changes with this administration that are going to affect your day-to-day functioning as a real estate investor? Let's see. Affect my day-to-day functioning? No. I mean, I'm certainly paying attention through my property managers of the laws and regulations in the local areas that I'm investing in. Again, I come from Seattle, Washington, which is one of the, well, it's becoming one of the most unfriendly <laughs> landlord cities. Fortunately, again, I own properties outside of the city of Seattle, so I am not subject to these new you know, city council rules. But I'll give you an example, one that is currently, let's see, they're, they're voting on is to have an eviction moratorium for two years after the CDC eviction moratorium is up. And that is a big blow to landlords. I mean, imagine, you know, the the public outcry with these landlords. I mean, most of them are not, you know, they don't own thousands of units. These are, you know, mom and pop people who have invested in these properties and owned these properties for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years for retirement income. And now they can't evict their tenants for up to two years after the eviction moratorium is up. I mean, how can how can a, a business survive that, right? I mean, you imagine, you know, if you look at any other business and and have that kind of regulation and and rule around collecting revenue based on a based on a contractual agreement, you know, that that's a big blow. So, you know, back to the the question again. I'm not sure what's to come. Very fortunately, again, I have mentioned my investing strategy is the same as it was in 2009. And so I run my portfolio at about 50% loan to value. And, you know, our cash flow is, you know, considerably higher uh, than the mortgage payment. Our debt coverage ratio, I think, is about 1.6, meaning 60% of our tenants could not be paying and we would still, still be able to support the debt. So again, I'm a conservative investor. I I make sure that, you know, we are in a place to afford all of our mortgage payment no no, no matter what happens. And I think that investors need to be considering these things. I think to your your point, Rich, a lot of investors, newer investors are looking to get in and there's kind of this like feeding frenzy. And so they're willing to maybe overpay for properties 
or you can get into properties that are, you know, where they put 20 to 25% down and they're negative cash flow every month. To me, that is very risky because we don't know what the future holds and we don't know what the future brings. So I, I, I think, again, I'm going to continue to do what I've always done for, you know, the last uh, let's see, 12, 13 years here. And I, I'm continuing to invest in this market, uh, utilizing 1031 exchanges and buying into landlord friendly markets. And then I'll, I'll just, yeah, kind of pivot as we need based on, you know, the changes that may or may not come. I think what becomes clear after talking to you both is that the larger structural investors probably did find during the COVID pandemic that they had the funding and procedures in place to manage the ups and downs, to be advocates for their tenants, but also to protect their business. While as some of the smaller investors like me probably didn't deal with the bumps as well, because we're dealing with a small number of properties, maybe a big number of problems. And for us, the calculus of whether it was worthwhile or not may not be the same for the bigger investors. It's an interesting conversation. And certainly, I think a lot of our impressions of what was going to happen at the beginning of the pandemic didn't really bear out the way we thought they would. This has been a great conversation. I've been really excited to have you. I want to end this episode slightly different than I usually do. I usually ask you what's up next in your life and where can we find you? But instead, Rich, I'm going to pose the question to you. What would cause you to liquidate everything? It sounds like high prices might be what gets you out of real estate. Are there other, you know, apocalyptic changes that would say, okay, I'm done. I'm out. All right. What would cause me to liquidate everything? Well, even if I liquidated everything, that doesn't mean that I've left real estate. I don't, I don't believe I'm leaving real estate. If I liquidated everything, it's because I made a judgment call that that would be what will make me the most income or money over the long term. And if the opportunity is right, and I, and I could find the right other market and opportunity. Yes, I could 1031 summer all of that money. Uh, or I could find something else to do with that money and be ready to pounce in the future when potentially we're in a very different looking real estate market and uh, I'd be poised to do something. So I don't think, I mean, I guess the thing that would get me out for sure and that would probably get most people out is if we had extremely unfriendly you know, laws towards real estate on a, on a wide scale. And I believe that would affect prices of real estate. And I believe that that would drive like a, a massive collapse in markets. I suppose that'd get me out and I suppose I'd lose money getting out, but I actually don't think that's going to happen. And Rich, if people want to learn more about you and your real estate investing, where can they find out more? Sure. Uh, I, have a, I have a blog called Rich on Money. It's richonmoney.com. And then uh, as you read blog posts, you'll also see that I usually have a video that takes you to my YouTube channel as well. I think I'm probably an ultra conservative real estate investor, but uh, go ahead and take a look. Jennifer, one of the problems with the 1031 exchange is it really locks you into real estate more long term. Is there any major change that would make you want to liquidate everything? I mean, I, I share Rich's view on that. I mean, gosh, I'm, I'm trying to think of what could happen that would have me wanting to liquidate my entire portfolio. Like, my, my first, I, I guess, response to hearing that is that would be very expensive <laughs> tax wise. <laughs> that would I would I would I would have a very large tax bill should I ever consider doing that. So, I mean, again, you know, I'm kind of uh, going through. I mean, I'm on my let's see, fourth 1031 exchange. So I have been uh, kind of shifting, you know, some of our older properties and also in markets that have had high appreciation into nicer, newer properties that are more landlord friendly. I will continue along with that plan so long as the IRS 1031 exchange is available to me. So again, I, I don't see myself selling or liquidating the entire portfolio because it would be incredibly expensive to do so. Unless maybe there was a uh, you know, tax law that allowed you to to sell and not pay taxes, maybe invest in another business or invest in another country or another asset class or, or something else, then maybe I would consider that. And if people want to hear more about your story or learn about you, how can they connect with you on the internet? 
Yeah, so the best place is my website that is addicted to ROI.com. And I have a community of real estate investors. We help people invest in other markets across the United States. And we just have a really phenomenal community of people living a big life and, and you know, doing a lot of different investing strategies. So definitely go check us out. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Rich Carey and Jennifer Beatles. That's a wrap. Welcome back to our community segment. Are you an earner or an investor? Before we jump in, you should visit us at our Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash earn and invest. Again, that's facebook.com slash group slash earn and invest. That is where you can continue to have conversations that are started on every Monday and Thursday on the podcast. We talk about just about everything there from personal finance to financial independence you name it, current events, we cover it all. And that is a place where you as the community can come together and talk about what matters. A big thank you to Jennifer Ma. She posted a blog post from livingafi.com. Again, that's livingafi.com. Many of you guys remember or might remember this blogger. He wrote a very popular financial independence blog up until about 2.15, and then he left his job and somewhat disappeared. Well, all of a sudden, he resurfaced in 2021 with a new blog post. There is the link on our Facebook page, but it's a really interesting conversation. The reason being is that he retired early in 2015, and then we never heard anything about it again until 2021. His update, to say the least, is sobering. It turns out that he got divorced, he returned to work, and the things he thought were so important when he started this journey are much different than the things he thinks are important now. And I think it's an important lesson. A lot of us look at early retirement as the goal. We look at financial independence even as the goal. But what we often find is that those are levers that give us the opportunity to really explore our own unique purpose, identity, and connections. And until we find what that purpose, identity, and connections are, It's very difficult to be happy. So you can retire early. You can get to financial independence. All that sounds great. But unless you know what you really want out of life and who you are, that victory reigns kind of empty. It just doesn't feel like that goal, which you thought was so important, actually has the true meaning you thought it did. On the other hand, when you find purpose, identity, and connections in your life, It occurs to me that maybe the finances are less important, so you don't necessarily have to get to that place of financial independence. You don't necessarily have to retire early when you're living a life that is full of these things that are meaningful to you. Check out livingafi.com. That's where this blog post appeared. And thank you, Jennifer Ma, for posting it in the Earn and Invest Facebook group. Clearly, Livingafi, as well as you, are earners, but Additionally, we have to invest in our lives. We have to become investors in what our true meaning, purpose, identity, and connections are. And once we do that, we're a lot more likely to be happy, regardless of what our net worth is. Cool. That was a lot of fun. Wow. Great questions. Yeah, Yeah, really, really great questions, Doc. I think it's a great discussion. Um, Yeah, I, I, you know, the thing about it is I I actually am surprised, and I kind of knew this going in, that people were not as affected as you would think they would be, especially the bigger investors, right? So Mm -hmm. the people holding one or two, the problem is you hold one or two or three or four doors, something major goes wrong with one or two of them, and it's like, it feels like everything's a mess. But if you own 30 doors and one or two have a problem, you're thinking, well, on balance, things are going well. I think, and I I guess I meant to bring this up earlier, uh, but... What you what you said is very astute about the the you know larger investor versus the the mom and pop 
or reluctant landlord who ended up with one or two units. Um, I think a big part of that too is what's the quality of your tenants that are in your properties. And I don't necessarily mean like, are they D or C or B properties? I mean, how well screened are they and, and how long have you been doing this? And in cases where people are fairly well screened and, you know, you've been careful about who you put in your properties and you sort of, you know, looked at credit scores and, and looked at uh, ability to pay and looked at, you know, whether or not they had any problems with previous landlords, I think we just tend to saw less problems, you know, of people that just, are, yeah, just decided to take advantage of the system. But if you're new to this and if you were desperate to put somebody in the property and you just put somebody in and then that person got the memo that this is the time to take advantage of your landlord, then yeah, I think that happened a lot more to the mom and pop mm -hmm. uh, than it did to the institutional investor or, or just larger investor. And I think you guys also have better processes either through management companies or at least through, right? So you have your people in every location that manage things such that almost everything is a text or call away mm -hmm. and it gets done yeah. and managed and you don't have to put as much thought into it. For me, Absolutely. I have four oh. units and we screened pretty well. Our problem was just everything broke down because everyone was working from home. And mm -hmm. so it was just a series of, in all four of our units, I was getting texts every day. This is no longer working. This is not working. That's a problem. And so, yeah, it was a matter of phone calls, right? So when yeah. I looked at, when I did my tax return this year, I still cash flowed actually $50,000 on four units, right? So that's not bad. $50,000 cash flow on four units, but, mm -hmm. and that was down from last year, about 10,000, but Mm -hmm. The pain factor for me was like, okay, but I spent lots of time just fielding phone calls, connecting people, hearing gripes, trying to get things done, et cetera. But, you know, it's a, it's a amazing for me. It's a, it, I'm surprised that I feel this way, but like I took over management of my properties in the last <clears> year <throat> and I just did that. I mean, I just did that so I could make an extra, I, I estimate I'm making yeah, an extra 3000 a month, yeah, yeah. you know, 3000 a month by managing it myself, but probably also making more because I'm also managing the money better, managing the expenses better and more involved in the day-to-day, the -day. it hasn't been that much work. Uh, it's because my property management company was doing pretty good. And it's because that I made improvements on top of that. And I do almost everything online. Everything is texting, right? And yeah, web-based yeah. and, and portals. Mm -hmm. But I find myself annoyed by like really small things, kind of like what you talked about, like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, like there's this problem with like, you know, uh, squirrels living in an attic, they just won't go away or problems with cockroaches or problems with, and I'm just, and I find myself, well, I could hand over, you know, I could hand this over to a property management company again, but there is that, that other feeling of like, well, I could just sell everything and move on to something else. And it's surprising. Uh, I, I guess I've been surprised uh, maybe recently how appealing the idea of potentially taking a break from uh, owning real estate might be. And it's something that I'm considering. Yeah. The other thing that I found is you as more structural investors get a lot better return long-term, right? Because you take advantage yeah. of all the tax issues. You yeah. tend to find better properties in better locations where you get a higher cash flow. Yeah. For someone who's doing it on the small level, a lot of the times you would probably just do better by throwing it in a, in a general index fund and leaving it for the okay. next 15 or 20 years. <laughs> it's true. But you yeah. guys, because you, you know your processes so well, your numbers dwarf what an S&P 500 index would do. But Absolutely. again, there's that difference between casual investor mm -hmm. and structural investor. Like I became a casual investor because I knew I had lots of money in the stock market. And I was like, okay, I need to diversify how far can I diversify from a basic index fund? I was like, I need to landlord and own some properties. My parents had done it. So it made sense. So I bought a bunch of properties. I cash flowed. It was great. But I didn't get nearly the return someone like you would. On the other hand, I didn't need it in this case for my portfolio. It had a very different, it fulfilled a very different position for me, right? It was more balancing mm -hmm. my asset allocation as opposed to be a major driver of wealth for me. But yeah. No, I, I, you know, I think what I think of when you bring that up is, uh, I don't know if the right word is selection bias, but I mean, we're on podcasts or the reason that I'm on a podcast is because yeah. I'm this like unique, unusual case where somebody made a, like a, a kind of a large amount of money from real estate in a specific, in a specific location. And their story just seems like, wow, that's, that's unusual how that happened. 
And I think that is probably also true in, in, in Jennifer's case. And in sometimes, um, the fact, I guess my point is the fact that that is like easily duplicated. I mean, it's not, it's not always easily duplicated. I think that people can do very well in real estate, but if, if we're throwing out like our specific numbers and saying like, this is what you should expect to do if, if you follow my exact plan, that might not always work because you might not start in Montgomery, Alabama in 2013, right? Or, or, in, or in, you know, Seattle at, the, at a specific time or, or take another, uh, another uh, person on podcasts and insert their story. So I think that creates un, unreasonable expectations sometimes for some people. You guys also, I think, have certain set of personality traits that makes you very successful at it that not everybody has. So I think people who have a certain set of personality traits find it much easier to navigate these things than others who yeah. who would go to a nine to five job, make two hundred thousand dollars a year, and save and invest, and by the time they were in the thirties or forties, would have a few million dollars saved up, mm-hmm. and then would be kind of passively getting income from their investments. But. Mm-hmm. I would be curious though, Doc, had you had property managers in, uh, or a property manager in so, place, would your yeah. experience be different? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I yeah. still feel like around here, you still have to manage your property managers. I mean, again, I think if you have 30 or 40 units, it's different than you have, you have three or four. I think you have to kind of watch sure. them closely, but yeah. maybe, right? Yeah. I mean, right. I, in my, my experience with property managers, just to piggyback on Jennifer, um, I... I had to pick the right one from the beginning, fi- fire a few, find the right one. And even at the beginning of my relationship with them, I don't want to say train them, but like mold them, correct them, course corrections. But at a certain point, it was fairly largely on autopilot for a long time. And I was very happy. Yeah. And I could, I could do that again and be happy. Mm. And and maybe that for you is the answer is is mm-hmm. is have more more managers and just let them go on autopilot and knowing there's some inefficiency there. But again, it depends on the role it plays in your portfolio. I think probably all three of us are at very different points in our lives too, which sure. the income streams mean very different things. But yeah, and I think another thing too about real estate business and any type of success. Uh, for me, I was trying really hard to do something in real estate since 2000. And uh, I did lots of different things. I, I flipped houses. I tried to flip a new construction. I mean, I was investing in more expensive markets uh, from 2003 to 2013. And everything was very unimpressive. Like everything I did was very unimpressive. But I just kept trying. I just kept learning. I just kept like pressing ahead and, 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 and determined to figure out real estate. And then I think, you know, um, opportunity fell into my lap. I kind of just like, oh, wow, this is interesting. These numbers look really good. I don't know if this is going to actually work, but let's give it a shot. And it did. But I guess my point is, I guess you could say that's luck, but I mean, you know, 13 years of, you know, trotting and trotting and finally opportunity comes along. I guess it's a little more than luck. It's, it's also determination and persistence and, you know, willing to do what it takes to get it done. 